Hello dear viewer, welcome to Vikasana YouTube channel. I am Dr. Chandrakala HD, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science, GFGC Madhuri. This is part 3 video of CPU scheduling. This is in continuation with the part 1 and part 2 videos which you have viewed earlier. In this video, we will be learning CPU scheduling algorithms. There are six commonly used CPU scheduling algorithms, namely first come first serve scheduling algorithm, shortest job first scheduling algorithm, priority algorithm, round robin scheduling algorithm, multi level queue algorithm, multi level feedback queue algorithm. In this video, we will be learning these algorithms in detail and also learn how to compute waiting time for a given set of processes using these CPU scheduling algorithms. Let us start with the first scheduling algorithm, first come first serve scheduling algorithm. This is a very simple algorithm. This algorithm will maintain the queue of processes which are waiting for CPU allotment in FIFO structure. FIFO means first in, first out. So whichever process enters the ready queue first will be the one to get the CPU first. This is the strategy which is used for process scheduling in FCFS algorithm. This algorithm is a non-primitive scheduling algorithm which means once the CPU is allotted to a particular process, the process keeps the CPU till it completes its entire CPU burst time. This algorithm suits for batch processes where the user does not expect too much of interaction with the computer when the process is executing. Now, let us take an example set of processes and learn how to write a Gantt chart and how to compute waiting time for the FCFS algorithm. We have taken a set of three processes, P1, P2, and P3. Their burst time requirements are 24 milliseconds, 3 milliseconds, and 3 milliseconds respectively. We plot a Gantt chart for this set of processes. So the Gantt chart shows a timeline of the time at which a process started its execution and ended its execution. So for FCFS, since we follow first come first serve strategy, P1 is the one which entered the CPU first. So that will get the first chance to execute on the CPU. P1 will be scheduled for execution first. P1 requires 24 milliseconds, so it starts at 0th millisecond and completes at 24th millisecond. At 24th millisecond, P1 would have completed its execution. Then the CPU will be released by P1 voluntarily. After this, P2 will get a chance to execute at the 24th millisecond. P2 requires 3 milliseconds, so it executes till the 27th millisecond. And later, the third process to enter the queue, P3, will get a chance to execute from 27 to 30 milliseconds. So this is the Gantt chart using FCFS strategy for the given set of processes P1, P2, P3. Now, let us calculate the waiting time for each process. Using the Gantt chart itself, you can easily note down the waiting times for the process. So in the Gantt chart, the time at which the process started is its waiting time, meaning that till that time the process was waiting for CPU allotment. So the waiting time for P1 is 0, for P2 is 24 milliseconds, and for P3 is 27 milliseconds. To calculate the average waiting time, we have to add up the waiting time for all three processes and divide the total by the total number of processes. So here, the total 
sum of the waiting times is 0 plus 24 plus 27 that is 53 divided by 3 sorry 51 divided by 3 which gives us 17 milliseconds so for FCFS we learned how to plot the Gantt chart how to find out the waiting time and how to find the average waiting time. So if you observe here, one main drawback in the FCFS algorithm is if a long CPU burst time requirement process enters the queue before the shorter processors, like in this case, P1 is a long process of 24 milliseconds. It entered the queue first. Hence, it took 24 milliseconds. Therefore, the P2 and P3, which required short CPU bursts of just 3 milliseconds, had to wait for a long time on the CPU. So, this is the drawback of FCFS algorithm. We call it as a convoy effect, where a longer process entering the queue first will delay and increase the waiting time for the shorter processes which come behind them. So, if you observe here, if the processes were in the order P2, P3, P1, meaning that P2 entered the queue first, P3 entered next, and P1 entered last. If this was the order of entry, then using FCFS, the Gantt chart would look like this. P2 would get the first chance to execute because that is the one which entered the queue first. So, P2 would execute from 0 to 3 milliseconds. Next, the second process to enter the queue, P3, will execute for 3 to 6 milliseconds. And P1, which required 24 milliseconds, was the one which entered last in the queue. So, it executes from 6 to 30 milliseconds, total 24 milliseconds. So, in this case, if the order of the previous example which we had taken had modified in this fashion, the waiting time for P1 is 6 milliseconds, for P2 0 milliseconds, for P3 3 milliseconds, and the average waiting time would be 6 plus 0 plus 3, that is 9, divided by 3, which is just 3 milliseconds. Instead of 17 milliseconds, the average waiting time would have been only 3 milliseconds. So, the FCFS algorithm generally suffers from convoy effect, meaning that a short process behind long process waiting for a long time for CPU allotment. But the advantage of FCFS is it's very easy to understand and implement. The drawback is it has convoy effect. To overcome this drawback of FCFS algorithm, other algorithms, scheduling algorithms were developed. Now we shall see the next scheduling algorithm, the shortest job first algorithm. In case of shortest job first algorithm, it's a very intelligent algorithm. Whenever it sees a set of processes which have to be scheduled, it checks the CPU burst time of the process and it reorders the queue in such a way that the job or the process which requires shorter CPU burst time will get the chance to execute first. So it will reorder the queue in terms of ascending order of CPU burst requirement from small to large and allocates the CPU in that order itself. So this particular Algorithm is also a non-primitive algorithm which suits batch processes and wherever it is very easy to estimate the CPU time. In such cases, the shortest job first algorithm suits best. Now, let us take an example set of processes and learn how to write Gantt chart and how to compute average waiting time for SJF scheduling algorithm. So in this example, you have taken four processes, P1, P2, P3, and P4, and the burst times are 6, 8, 7, 3 milliseconds respectively. 
So as per the strategy of shortest job for scheduling algorithm, the process which requires the shortest CPU burst is P4 and next shortest is P1, next shortest is P3 and the next shortest is 8. So if we arrange the processes in ascending order of their uh, CPU burst time requirements, the order in which the processes will be sent for execution using SJFR, P4, P1, P3 and P8. So in the Gantt chart, we start with P4 because that requires the shortest burst time. P4 is given CPU at 0th millisecond. It executes till its requirement of 3 milliseconds, then gives back the CPU. The next shortest job in the queue is P1. It starts at 3 milliseconds and executes for next 6 milliseconds, that is up to 9 milliseconds. Then the next shortest is P3. It starts at 9 milliseconds and executes till 16 milliseconds, total 7 milliseconds in fact. And the last process in the queue P2 requires the longest CPU burst. So it gets the CPU at 16 milliseconds and continues its execution till 24th millisecond. Now, if we check the average waiting time of this particular example with SJF algorithm, the waiting time for P1 is 3, for P2 is 16 milliseconds, for P3, 9 milliseconds, and P4, 0 millisecond. If we add this up, 3 plus 16 plus 9 plus 0 is 28. 28 divided by 4, which is the total number of process in the given example, 28 divided by 4 gives you 7 milliseconds, which is the average waiting time for this set of four processes using shortest job for scheduling algorithm. The next scheduling algorithm, which we will learn, is priority scheduling. In this algorithm, the scheduler will allot priority for the processes or sometimes the process come up with added priority to the ready queue. Based on the priority, the higher priority processes will get chance to execute first. So the priority scheduling algorithm gives more priority to higher priority processes and allocates the CPU. This algorithm is also a non-primitive scheduling algorithm. So you might ask, what if two processes come with the same priority or equal priority to the ready queue? In that case, the tie is broken using the first come first serve basis. Out of the two equal priority processes, whichever entered the queue first will get the first chance to execute. Now let us take an example set of processes and learn how to calculate average waiting time for the processes using priority scheduling. So we have five processes in this particular example. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. And first times for these processes are 10, 1, 2, 1 and 5 respectively. For priority scheduling, an additional data which is the Priority of the process is also given in the question. So here the highest priority is for P2. Next is P5. Then third priority is P1. Fourth priority is P3. And fifth priority is P4. In this priority order itself, processes will be chosen for execution. So if you observe this Gantt chart, P2 is the one which gets a chance to execute or P2 is the one which is scheduled first for execution. Mm -hmm. P2 gets the CPU immediately at 0 millisecond. It requires only 1 millisecond of burst time. So it executes, completes its execution and gives back the CPU at 1 millisecond. Then the second priority process which is P5 requiring 5 milliseconds will be given a chance to execute. It executes from 1 to 6 milliseconds. The third priority process of 10 millisecond burst time requirement, that is P1, 
will be given chance next. It executes from 6 to 16 milliseconds. The fourth priority process P3 requiring only 2 milliseconds will be given chance next. It executes from 16 to 18. And the last priority process P4 requiring 1 millisecond will execute from 18 to 19 millisecond. And this is what we plot in the Gantt chart. Now we compute the average waiting time for these set of processes. The waiting time for P1 is 6 milliseconds. For P2, it's 0 milliseconds. P3, 9 milliseconds. P4, 18 milliseconds. P5 is 1 millisecond. So a total of 41 milliseconds of waiting time for the five processes divided by the total number of processes which is 5 41 divided by 5 is 8.2 milliseconds average waiting time the fourth scheduling algorithm is round robin scheduling algorithm round robin scheduling algorithm is a preemptive scheduling algorithm which is very useful on interactive systems. The strategy used in round robin scheduling is the CPU time will be divided into time quantum like 2 milliseconds, 3 milliseconds or 4 milliseconds and this time quantum or time slice is given in a round robin fashion to all the processes in the ready queue starting from first process First process gets the slice of time. Once the slice of time is over, once the time quantum is over, automatically the first process will be printed and second process will get the next time quantum to execute on the CPU. So after its time quantum expires, the third process and so on. Once the end of the queue is reached, again, the time quantum allotment starts from the beginning of the queue from P1 P2, P3, so on. So choosing a time quantum is a key decision in case of round robin algorithm. If we have highly interactive processes which require um, shorter CPU burst, we should choose time quantum to be very small. Whereas if you have a batch system requiring long CPU burst, the time quantum should be chosen as a longer Let's take an example and learn how to plot a Gantt chart and how to calculate average waiting time using round robin scheduling algorithm. The example taken here consists of three processes P1, P2, P3. Worst times are T4, 24, 3, and 3. The time quantum we take here is 4 millisecond. So let's plot the Gantt chart here. So as we all know, round robin algorithm takes the time quantum of 4 milliseconds and starts to give it from P1 in the ready queue. So P1 should get 4 milliseconds, then P2, next 4 milliseconds, next P3, next 4 milliseconds. Again, go back to the beginning of the queue. P1, 4 milliseconds, P2, 4 milliseconds, P3, 4 milliseconds, and so on. This is the strategy used in round robin. So for this example, let us analyze how the time quantum will be given and how the processes behave. So first, the first time quantum is given to P1. At 0th millisecond, P1 receives the first time quantum of 4 milliseconds. It executes till 4 milliseconds. Actual requirement of P1 is 24 milliseconds. So at 4th millisecond, P1 will be printed and the next process P2 will be given the time quantum. So at fourth millisecond, P2 gets four milliseconds, but it requires only three milliseconds. At seventh millisecond, P2 would have completed its execution. So it will give back the CPU automatically. So the next time quantum of four milliseconds will be given by P3 by the algorithm. P3 requires only three milliseconds. It executes from 7 to 10, only 3 milliseconds of the total of 4 milliseconds given to it. And it will give back the CPU at 10 millisecond. Now the next turn starts. P1 will get the 
4 milliseconds so it executes from 10 to 14 but still it requires 16 more milliseconds of execution time so if you observe in the queue p2 and p3 have completed and terminated so p1 is the only process in the ready queue so even the next time quantum will be given to p1 next all time quantums in fact so p1 gets the next time quantum from 14 to 18 4 milliseconds again yet another next time quantum 18 to 22 next time quantum 22 to 26 and the next time quantum 26 to 30 so p1 would have taken six time quantums of four milliseconds six fours are 24 milliseconds to complete its execution now coming to the average waiting time calculation the waiting time for p1 if you observe is 10 milliseconds in the second instance where it started execution again and it continued from there on so it looks it waited for 10 milliseconds but out of these 10 milliseconds it has done execution for 4 milliseconds it was not simply waiting all 10 milliseconds out of those 10 milliseconds it was executing for 4 milliseconds so you have to subtract those 4 milliseconds of computation from the waiting time so 10 minus 4, total 6 millisecond was the waiting time for P1. For P2, the waiting time was 4 and P3, the waiting time was 7. So 6 plus 4 is 10, 10 plus 7 is 17, 17 divided by 3 is 5.66 milliseconds. This is the waiting time using round robin algorithm for the given set of processes. The next scheduling algorithm is multi-level queue scheduling algorithm. Multi-level queue scheduling algorithm is a combination of the previous methods. The previous four methods, FCFS, SJF, priority and round robin algorithms are basic scheduling algorithms. Multi-level queue scheduling combines uh, two or more of the previous four algorithms to do effective scheduling, to do optimized scheduling. So the main strategy used in multi-level queue scheduling is the ready queue will be partitioned into separate queues. So say for example, ready queue is partitioned into two uh, queues, foreground queue and background queue. Foreground queue consists of highly interactive processes background queue consists of batch processes which do not require too much of interaction and the processes will be permanently assigned to these sub queues foreground and background queue so each queue will have an independence to execute to make use of any of the scheduling algorithms say so foreground processes can make use of round robin scheduling which is very uh, useful for interactive processes as we have learned earlier and the background queue might use FCFS which is the best one for batch processes so out of these two queues priority will be high priority will be given to foreground processes and low priority will be given to background processes because foreground processes will have a uh, better chance to complete faster or Another possibility is between these two queues, again, a round robin scheduling can be followed. 80% of the time quantums can be given to RR, I mean, foreground queue, and 20% time can be given to background queue as well. So, the main idea in multi level queue scheduling is we split the ready queue into multiple queues, and each queue can make use of any scheduling algorithm. And to schedule between the queues also, you can make use of any of the four scheduling algorithms which we have learned earlier. So in this diagram, we can see that the ready queue is broken into five different queues. System process queue, interactive queue, interactive editing process queue, batch process queue and student process queue. 
the highest priority is given to system processes which are generally operating system processes lowest priority is given to student processes the processes are permanently assigned to these queues and the highest priority queue which is the system process will get a chance to execute its processes on the cpu once all the processes on the system process queue are completed next the cpu will be allocated to interactive processes after all processes are over in this queue next chance is for interactive editing processes and next chance is batch process and later chance is only for the lowest priority queue student processes there is one more twist in this strategy say currently the cpu is executing interactive editing process queue processes if at all during this time any process enters either system processes or interactive processes the processes in interactive editing process queue will be suspended and cpu jumps to the execution of the previous higher priority queues so if you observe this any particular queue will get a chance to execute only if all the processes in the previous queues are completely executed the main drawback with this multi level queue scheduling is this itself a low priority queue process might have to wait indefinitely to get its chance for executing and it might age in the queue itself since the processes are fixed in the particular queues itself they don't have a chance to move between queues they are stagnated in the queue and sometimes they have to wait too long to get the cpu for execution causing um, huge waiting time and the average waiting time for multi level queue scheduling can be high in most cases to overcome this drawback the next scheduling algorithm multi level queue feedback scheduling algorithm was developed so here the strategy used is the queues the ready queues are classified into three queues say queue 0 which is scheduled based on time quantum 8 milliseconds rr scheduling with time quantum 8 milliseconds second queue q1 which is scheduled using rr scheduling algorithm with 16 millisecond time quantum and the third queue q2 which is scheduled using fcfs scheduling algorithm so first any process which enters the system goes to quantum 8 q that is q0 so if at all its time quantum requirement is 8 millisecond or less it will execute and exit from the first queue itself if at all it couldn't complete within 8 milliseconds it is going to move to the next queue of 16 millisecond time quantum here it can continue execution if it completes its rest part within the 16 millisecond time quantum allocated then it will exit from the queue 1 if at all it is still longer than 16 millisecond time it will move to the next queue fcfs queue so uh, fcfs queue will give the longest cpu burst time for any process as we have learned it's a non preemptive version if at all a process gets a chance to execute on the cpu it can hold the cpu till it completes its last instruction execution so surely if a process enters fcfs scheduling queue it will complete and exit from the system so this is a better strategy shorter cpu burst time requirement processes can finish very fast moderate one also can finish in a moderate speed and longer uh, cpu burst requirement processes will also complete without indefinite waiting so there is some fixed time limit within which the process can be expected to complete its execution so this is how the multi level queue feedback scheduling works it allows the processes 
to migrate between the queues and avoids the indefinite waiting problem which existed in the multi-level queue scheduling algorithm. So these are six scheduling algorithms which are very important in this particular chapter. You can be asked problems on plotting the Gantt chart and calculation of average waiting time for a given set of processes using the first four methods FCFS, SJF priority and round robin method. You can be asked short notes on multi-level queue scheduling and multi-level feedback scheduling. So with this, we have completed the CPU scheduling chapter. Thank you for viewing the video. Please like, share and subscribe to the Sena YouTube channel. Thank you.